Welcome, everybody. This is Dr. Peter Hirsch of the CLAI Center for Terror Deconis. We're happy you could all join us for tonight's webinar. We have been, as you know, putting on a series looking at various aspects of keratoconus, research into keratoconus, clinical care, surgery. And tonight we're going to hear about some very new and special contact lenses. Uh, there are innovative new lenses, scleral lenses, and others that Dr. Gellies will be talking about that are really exciting options for the KC patient, which have been able to bring about vision that heretofore uh, we've not been able uh, to, to obtain. The Cornea Laser Eye Institute Center for Keratoconus began in 2000. Uh, and two, I was uh, the founder and original medical director. And we now have with us a Dr. John Geldes, who is the head of our specialty contact lens division, as indeed, as you'll see uh, tonight, probably the most experienced keratoconus contact lens uh, practitioner uh, in, in the country. And Dr. Stephen Greenstein, who is our primary corneal surgeon, who you've heard from in past webinars um, discussing new innovations in, in the treatment of, of keratoconus. Uh, at the Celia Kennett Center for Keratoconus, we actually uh, ran the original uh, collagen cross-linking clinical trials. Uh, I happen to be medical monitor, uh, and we wrote the papers uh, that approved a cross-linking for both uh, keratoconus and corneal ectasia. Uh, in the United States. So at the CLI Center for Keratoconus, we're really dedicated to all aspects of KC, from the research, to clinical trials, to advanced treatment techniques uh, to make the keratoconus uh, patient see even better. So I'd like to introduce now Dr. John Gellies, uh, director of the Specialty Contact Lens Division of the CLAI Center for Keratoconus, who's gonna discuss some exciting new options. John? Excellent, thank you, Peter. All right, everybody, well, thank you so much for joining us. I'm gonna go ahead and jump right into this and really to understand the type of contact lens that we are uh, working on here at CLEI. Uh, first, we really need to understand how vision in the eye works. So the eye in general is very similar to a camera. You can kind of compare the two in that a camera has a series of lenses and in the eye, those lenses that would be analogous to that are the cornea and the intraocular lens that you see down here. Um, the light then is focused through those lenses onto a sensor in the camera here. And that sensor in the eye is actually the retina. It is a, a sensory organ in the back of the eye that covers the back side of the eye. Uh, next would be the circuitry from that sensor would go to the processor in the phone, uh, just like the optic nerve goes from the back of the eye all the way into the brain, into the visual cortex where vision is processed and that's what allows us to see. So just like in the camera, the light goes through all those lenses, hits the sensor, goes down all the circuitry and hits the processor. Same thing happens with the eye. The light comes into the eye, hits the cornea, the intraocular lens, gets bent to a focal point on the retina, and from that retina, it goes down the optic nerve to the visual cortex where it's processed and we can see. So the cornea, is the most important part in the focusing system of the eye. It provides about two thirds of the focusing power of the eye. And in a normal eye, the cornea is smooth, round, and has an even curvature. It's a very dome-like structure. And when it focuses all that light, it brings it all to a single point in the back of the eye, and that's what gives us crisp clear vision. Now in keratoconus, instead of having that clear dome structure like you see here, this nice, even, smooth surface, the cornea becomes peaked and irregular. Keratoconus is a progressive corneal disease. It's really characterized 
by a loss of strength of the corneal tissue with focal thinning of the cornea, like what you see here, the cornea is thinner in this area than it is in the periphery. And that thinning allows the cornea to bulge and protrude and become a apically steep cornea. So you can see that steepness to the peak of the cornea. What that does is it affects the vision. Instead of getting light rays that then bend to the same focal point in the eye to give us crisp, clear vision, what happens is the variable curvature across the cornea causes the light rays to bend to various different points on the retina, causing the vision to be overlapped, doubled, increase the amount of halos, flare, glare, and blur that we see. Individuals with keratoconus often complain of those visual phenomena, but also in the reduction of vision. We all know the maps or are familiar with the maps of the keratoconic cornea. We've all probably seen these maps. What these are are corneal topography maps, and we're able to map out the corneal structure or the corneal shape with these maps. The way that these work is with a corneal topographer, we project a series of rings onto the front surface of the cornea. And what we look at is the displacement of these rings from a perfect circle. And the displacement of those rings helps us map out the irregularity of the cornea. If we had a perfectly normal cornea, all these rings would be very evenly spaced and the corresponding map here would be totally green and even. When we look at the keratoconic cornea, you can see that the ring spacing is much more condensed and wider in certain areas. And what that does is it creates the irregular map that you see here, much like a topographic map of the United States, the blue is low like the basins or river valleys. The red to the white is steep like the peaks of a mountaintop. And the green is somewhere in between. If we had a normal cornea, it would be all green. In the keratoconic cornea, you can really see these peaks or the steepness of the cornea here. The more distorted these rings are or the more red the map becomes, red to white the map becomes, it means that we have worse keratoconus. Now, how do we then map out the vision of an individual? How can we understand what an individual with keratoconus is seeing? Well, we can actually map out the vision. This is called aberometry or wavefront aberometry. What this is, is an objective way to measure the visual quality of the eye. So what happens is with a very specific sensor, we can project a grid pattern into the eye. And we watch how that grid pattern is reflected back out of the eye and it hits a sensor. And on the sensor, we're able to see the spacing between the dots in the grid to tell the visual quality of an individual. What you can see down here is a map from an individual with keratoconus. If we had a perfect eye, those dots would be perfectly spaced apart and there would be no blurriness to those spots. In the keratoconic, keratoconic eye, you can see that the arrangement of the dots are varied. You can see that they're bunched up in some areas, spaced out in others, and that creates the displacement in the wavefront so that we could map out the visual acuity or rather the vision that the individual sees and see what the quality of their vision is. Now, in addition to seeing the, uh, the spots, which are very analogous to the rings that you had seen on the previous uh, uh, slide, we can change these into various different ways to understand the vision. We can turn them into color maps. So very much like the color maps from the topography, we can have color maps from the aberometry where we can see the irregularities present. 
we can turn these into bar graphs where we can say uh, or take a look at the individual types of uh, aberrations or distortions in the vision. We can also grade these in numeric value. So say that an individual has a certain amount of higher order aberrations present. Or lastly, we can simulate what an individual's vision would be like. This individual has keratoconus and you can see that their visual quality is quite poor. You can see that they have distortions in the visions and overlapping of those letters, which reduces the quality of the visual acuity. Another way to map this out is by what we call a point spread function. So if this keratoconic individual was to look at a perfect spot of light, this is the sort of distortion to that light that they would see. So this is a very good way for us to understand the vision of an individual with keratoconus. So let's go ahead and give some other examples of this. There are multiple types of aberrations. There are higher order aberrations and lower order aberrations. Lower order aberrations are those that can be fully corrected with glasses. So for people who have normal corneas, and have myopia or nearsightedness, hyperopia or farsightedness, or just regular astigmatism, those can all be corrected with glasses. And those individuals, when you correct them with glasses, have very clear vision. You can see the quality of this individual's vision is very good. You can see that their point spread function comes out with just a very small point of light there and their vision is quite good. These lower order aberrations can be fully corrected. Now, higher order aberrations are not correctable with glasses. Now, these higher order aberrations are what contribute to the quality of vision. So in this individual, when we try to correct them with their glasses, you can see that the quality of their vision is still poor. They still have a lot of these higher order aberrations which reduce the quality of the vision. These higher order aberrations are what contribute to the overlapping, the ghosting, and the smudging of the vision. These are pupil dependent, meaning that as the pupil is larger, we get more higher order aberrations that can distort the vision. So a good example of this is like being outside at nighttime or driving at nighttime. The pupil gets larger because it is darker out, but that larger pupil allows more higher order aberrations into the eye, which, which causes more increases in glare and halo and thus a reduction in the visual acuity. That's why individuals with keratoconus will tell you that their vision is, wor is worse when driving at nighttime. Now, if we took an eye, let's say we had a model eye, a perfect eye that was totally manufactured to perfection. This eye would have no higher order aberrations. You can see that their visual simulation on the right hand side, totally perfect. Their uh, points that we would get from the sensor, totally perfectly spaced. There's absolutely no higher order aberrations in this system. If we take a normal human eye and we map out the aberrations, there's a tiny bit of aberrations that are present. You can see in that point spread function, a little bit more than what we had in the model eye. If we look at the spacing here, there's a little more condensing of the spacing, but generally it's very even. These individuals with normal corneas have only very few higher order aberrations, and that allows them to be corrected almost completely with spectacles. And you can see that the visual stimulation here, these individuals have very, very good quality of vision. When we go to an individual with keratoconus, you can see that there's a lot of higher order aberrations present. You can see that their uncorrected vision, they have very, very blurry vision. Their point spread function is spreading 
the optics all over the place, the vision is generally very poor, and if we simulate that, this is what an individual with a keratoconus would see. It is not a very clear image. There's a lot of overlap, a lot of halo, flare, and glare. Now, if we correct this individual with keratoconus with glasses, you can see that we can improve the level of visual of vision, but we can't make it perfectly clear. You can see that, yes, the simulation improves, but it's far from clear. So why would we use specialty contact lenses? Well, specialty contact lenses mask the irregular shape of the cornea and allow the light to focus better towards the back of the eye, but it's not quite perfect. You can see that we have more of that focusing of the light going back there. So when we look at an individual wearing a specialty contact lens, you can see it masking the irregular corneal shape and you can see that the sensor quality is very improved, and you can see that the quality of the vision improves as well, but what you'll note is that it's not perfect and not back to the level of a normal eye. There are still a significant amount of higher order aberrations present. Now, when we map that out, you can see that the vision is much better than what it was in the previous slides without anything or with glasses, but it's not quite as good as what it is with a normal eye. So why isn't vision perfect with a contact lens? Well, when you do aberrometry over these contact lenses, you can see that the higher order aberrations are reduced, but they're not eliminated. So when we look at multiple studies out there, what we can see is that at baseline, without the contact lens on, you can see that they have a high level of aberrations present. And when they're corrected with the contact lenses, those aberrations are reduced significantly, but not to the level of a normal eye. An example of this is this patient here. You can see that they have a highly keratoconic eye, and they have a lot of aberrations present. You can see the distortion in their sensor. But when we put a contact lens on, a rigid specialty lens on the eye, you can see that if we map over the top of it, the surface is totally smooth, the higher order aberrations are reduced, the sensor quality is improved. And if we look at the amount of aberrations coming out of here, in the eye without the lens, we have a very high amount of higher order aberrations. And with the lens on, we have a much reduced level of higher order aberrations, but it's not perfect. And if we compare the vision between the two, you can see that this is very poor without the lens. And this is what it looks like with the lens, significantly better, but not perfect. So how can we improve the higher order aberrations or the residual higher order aberrations to give an individual an even better quality of vision? Well, the concept is very similar to noise canceling headphones. So for those of us who have worn those cancel noise canceling headphones, you'll know that when you put these on, the white noise that you would normally hear from let's say an airplane, that humming or buzzing, the noise coming in, the wavelength coming in, is then reversed in the, the headphone itself, and the two wavelengths cancel each other out to reduce the ambient noise. So instead of hearing the white noise, it's significantly reduced, and thus you no longer hear it. The idea here is to create an equal and opposite sign and then cancel it out altogether. Now this can be done with the vision. What we're doing is we're mapping out the aberration, we're mirroring that aberration, and then by placing that on the surface of the lens, we can go ahead and eliminate the aberration. So the idea is to add those two aberrations together, what's coming from the eye, what's created on the surface of the lens, so that it can cancel out the wavefront 
and to be able to create a much better quality of vision. So the idea is, is with a standard scleral lens, we can take the vision from being like this to being able to improve the vision to a level like this. You can see that those point spread functions with the standard lens, we still have some distortion. And with the higher order aberration correcting optics, it's much, much reduced. And you can see the improvement in the quality of the vision. You can see that everything here looks much clearer, brighter, and sharper in comparison to here. So higher order aberration correcting scleral lenses have been studied in the literature since 2012. Um, when we look at these, these lenses are capable in reducing the amount of aberrations present by about 40 to 60 percent and results in about one to two lines of vision improvement. So I'm going to share some cases that we've done in the pilot here, uh, five cases of individuals with various degrees of keratoconus so that you can see what sort of visual improvement they have. As you can see in this first case, this individual has a mild case of keratoconus. With his standard scleral lens, his visual acuity was 20, 30 minus. And when we corrected him with the higher order aberration correcting lens, his vision improved to 20, 25. He had a 1.5 uh, line of vision improvement and his higher order aberrations were reduced by about 55 percent. So we mapped out the individual aberrations here. The red indicates his old, his standard scleral lens, whereas the blue lines indicate his new higher order aberration correcting lens. And you can see that we've dramatically reduced the amount of aberrations. You can see that he went from a 0.76 down to a 0.34, so a very good improvement there. And if we look at his Snellen lines here, he went from being 2040 to 2030 at that 2030 minus, so kind of in between those lines, to being able to be improved to about 2025. So a big improvement there. When we look at case two, again, this is a mild keratoconus patient. His vision with his standard scleral lens was 2030. With his higher order aberration correcting lens, he's 2025 plus. When we look at his bars out here, you can see that he had a tremendous amount of those red bars present. And we reduce those significantly with the higher order aberration correcting lens in the blue bars. He also had about a 1.5 line improvement in visual acuity and about a 62% reduction of those higher order aberrations. When we look at it here, you can see that his vision started off at 2030 and he improved to about 2025 to 2020. So a very good improvement there. This next individual had moderate keratoconus you can see that they're getting more severe here in comparison to the previous eyes. And when we look at their visual acuity, again, we were able to reduce their visual acuity from 2025 down to 2020, so to make them better. This individual had about one line of visual acuity improvement and about a 45% reduction in those higher order aberrations. Again, you can see that our red bars were reduced and we have the resulting blue bars with the higher order aberration correcting scleral lens. When we look at the vision, again, this individual went from 2025 to 2020. The next case here, I um, <laughs> guess you don't get to see exactly how bad the individual was, but uh, this individual has severe keratoconus. Let me go ahead and just show you what that looks like. Um, if we were to take this map and put it out to the front, um, let's go ahead and do that here. You can see that this individual has very advanced levels of keratoconus. 
and we can take their visual acuity with their standard scleral lens and bring them down from 2030 to 2025 plus, so in between 2025 and 2020. Again, that's a 1.5 line improvement in visual acuity, and they appreciate that difference. Our last case for the night is extreme keratoconus. This individual has very bad keratoconus, as you can see. Their standard scleral lens was only able to correct them to about 2070. When we used our higher order aberration correcting scleral lens, we were able to bring them down to about 2025. So this individual experienced about five lines of visual acuity improvement. They went from 2070 all the way down to 2025. Their higher order aberrations reduced by about 47%. So when we look at this, if we do a summary of our initial cases with this, these individuals improve by anywhere from one to five lines. On average, two lines of visual acuity improvement and their higher order aberrations are reduced by about 40 to 62 percent. So on average, about a 50 percent reduction in the visual static. So a reduction in the halos, flare, glare, blur, and overlap uh, in, the, in their vision. They improve dramatically. Now, the question is, is who does well with these sorts of higher order aberration correcting lenses? Does everybody do well? Well, the people who tend to do less well are the individuals with corneal opacities or scars. However, this is very dependent on the density of the scar. If it's a very dense opaque scar, it'll cause scatter, which then can be more difficult to correct. And the ability for us to correct may be reduced. However, that's not to say that individuals with scars can't benefit from this. The individual with extreme keratoconus did have significant scarring, and we were still able to improve them by a very large amount. So it is possible uh, that these individuals may still experience very good improvements in visual acuity. Now here at the Cornea Laser Eye Institute, we're starting a clinical trial to evaluate the improvements with higher order aberration correcting scleral lenses. We're enrolling patients with keratoconus and ectasia into the trial. However, if you have other sorts of uh, irregular corneas, we will be able to try a higher order aberration correcting scleral lens on you. It just won't be part of the clinical trial. Again, in the clinical trial, we're enrolling people over the age of 18 years old. However, if you're younger than 18 years old, you can still have these lenses. They just won't be part of the clinical trial. There's no exclusion for individuals who may have had difficulty with previous lenses. We're open to having you involved. The only requirement for this is that you are available to be able to make it to all follow-up visits and all visits involving the higher order aberration correcting scleral lens. Now the individuals enrolled in this clinical trial at the end of the clinical trial will get to keep that higher order aberration correcting scleral lens and it will be provided uh, by the sponsor to you at no cost during the clinical trial. So how does this progress? Well, there are three main parts to the clinical trial. The first one is going to be fitting the lens. So this is similar to all other ways that we see individuals for scleral lenses. This is no real difference. We're just going to make sure that we fit the lens as ideally as possible and improve vision as well as we can 
with traditional optics. The second part is to get the higher order aberration correcting optics. The lens that you'll get will have a dot arrangement on the front surface. And what we'll do is we'll take a measurement with the device that you see here, the wavefront aberrometer. And with that data, we'll have a higher order aberration correcting surface put or manufactured into the lens to correct the vision. In part three, the follow-up, what we'll do is we'll dispense that higher order aberration correcting lens and we'll go ahead and we'll repeat measurements at various different time intervals to be able to see how much visual improvement we're able to get for you and to record that for the study. With that, I'll go ahead and open it back up and introduce you to Stacy Lazar, our GM here at the Cornea and Laser Eye Institute, and invite back Dr. Hirsch and Dr. Greenstein to answer some questions. Thank you, Dr. Gallies. We do have a few questions. Perfect. Let me just open this up. All right, so the first question is a patient had asked, how comfortable are these contact lenses? So these contact lenses are very much like standard scleral lenses. These are not done on surface-based uh, uh, technologies like an impression-based lens or a scan-based lens. Generally, these lenses are gonna be very, very comfortable. However, the fitting process is in depth. We do have to go through a series of lenses before we get an ideal fit with ideal comfort. All right, thank you. Do these contact lenses work if you've already had corneal collagen cross-linking? Yes, these contact lenses will work for individuals who have had corneal collagen cross-linking, even individuals who have had intacts, people who have had corneal transplants, uh, any sort of procedure is not going to bar you from participating in this. Um, individuals who have had intacts have had this done and had very good results with it. In fact, our extreme keratoconus case actually has intacts in and did very, very well with it. Now, to piggyback on that question, if a patient had a corneal transplant, PRK and CK, do you think they would still be able to get this type of contact lens? Likely, yes, they would be a candidate for that. Now, since they have had a corneal transplant, they would not be able to participate in the clinical trial. However, they would be able to still get the lenses uh, just not participate in the clinical trial. All right, thank you. Okay, so there is a type of lens called a laser fit lens. A patient is asking, how does this platform differ from the laser fit lenses, which use wavefront mapping aberrometry as well? So laser fit lenses were created by a doctor in Texas um, who has a proprietary system to himself based on uh, the same concept as what we're doing here. The, the, the approach that we are taking here was actually developed uh, at University of Rochester. And these guys had done this uh, far before um, the individual who uh, is doing the laser fit lens. Um, and this technology has been very, very vetted. Not to say that the laser fit or the laser guided lenses from Texas are not good. Uh, that is not what I'm saying. But what I am saying here is this is a different system 
done through a different process, but a similar concept with very, very good uh, studies uh, backing it up for pilot studies. And we've had very, very good information that's come out of our clinic thus far. And we expect to see that continued within the clinical trial. Thank you, Dr. Gellies. This next question has to do with cross-linking. So I want to bring this over to Dr. Hirsch. When someone has had cross-linking, has that caused scarring to the cornea in any way? Generally, cross-linking doesn't cause scarring. However, it does what we call a transient haze. So when you're cross-linked, what happens is that there are linkages. Think of putting extra wires on a suspension bridge to make the bridge stronger. And these linkages are between the collagen molecules and what we call the ground substance, the sugars that are around those molecules. So just as we put extra wires on a bridge, the extra linkages uh, in the cornea make the cornea stronger in keratoconus. When we do this, there is a transient haze. So this is a fine haze that kind of looks like a dusting on the cornea. You can't see it, but we can see it under magnification in the biomicroscope. It peaks at a, at a month. It stays pretty much the same for three months. Then it disappears. We find that after one year, things go back to baseline. The cornea is clear again. There are rare cases where there can be actual focal scars um, after cross-linking. These are typically in patients who have had scarring before or in patients who have very, very thin corneas. Thank you, Dr. Hirsch. All right, let me... All right, so this question is for Dr. Gellies uh, about the HOA lenses. How does the comfort of this lens compare to a piggyback method, which of course everybody knows is the hard and the soft lens? So, yes, yeah, so a piggyback lens, uh, being that it does have a rigid lens resting on top of a soft lens, generally individuals wearing that lens will feel the edge of the rigid lens every time they blink. Many individuals can wear that comfortably, but many individuals will have constant lens awareness. With individuals wearing a scleral lens, any type of scleral lens, not just this higher order aberration correcting one, but any type of scleral lens, these lenses are very large and very stable. Um, because of this, they reach under the lid margins uh, all the way around uh, the on the white of the eye. And because they're so large, they're very stable on the eye and don't rock or move. So the lids can glide very easily over the surface of the lens without bumping into the edges. The other thing that makes them very comfortable is that the lens in a scleral lens jumps over the corneal surface. It rests entirely on the white of the eye. Now, being that the cornea has the most innervation out of any of the organs of the body, um, it will be more comfortable because it's not constantly stimulating those corneal nerves. So if somebody is currently wearing uh, RGP lenses and they're comfortable and they're doing well, is it advantageous to switch to scleral lenses? Generally not. Typically what we tell individuals, scleral lenses are not the end-all be-all of all lenses. <laughs> there are a variety of different types of contact lenses for individuals with keratoconus. And each one of those types of lenses has a individual that would do very, very well in it. We've done actually a lot of studies here looking at that and what we find is that individuals with very advanced keratoconus seem to do very well with sclerals and piggyback lenses those with mild or moderate keratoconus will generally do well with either soft custom soft hybrid 
or corneal gas permeable lenses or small RGPs. So, you know, the individuals can be successful with any type of contact lens so long as it's fit well to their eye. So there's lots of options out there. If you're doing very well in a high or in a corneal lens, stay in that lens. There's no need to change unless it's impacting the corneal health or the visual acuity. Thank you. Now, will scleral lenses stop the forward progress of the disease? No, scleral lenses and any contact lens have no therapeutic value. They do nothing to stop the progression of the disease. Back in the, you know, prior to the 1970s, even in the early 1980s, it was thought that if you fit a very, very flat, corneal, rigid lens onto the surface, you could smush the cornea and stop progression of keratoconus. That is simply not true. The studies that have come out since the 90s have all shown that if you fit a flat lens, it doesn't stop progression and in fact will induce scarring of the cornea. So there is no therapeutic value derived from fitting contact lenses on individuals with keratoconus. Contact lenses are simply there to improve vision while you are wearing the contact lens. To stop progression of the disease, treatments like corneal collagen cross-linking need to be used, and corneal collagen cross-linking is currently the only treatment out there to stop progression of keratoconus. Thank you. Now, in regards to the study, is there an age limit and are there any side effects to these lenses? Got it. There are no age limits to who can enroll in the trial. We do have a uh, exclusion clause in the trial in that if an individual has a ocular disease other than keratoconus that limits the vision, such as, let's say, um, a retinal problem like macular degeneration or glaucoma, those individuals would not be somebody that we could enroll in the clinical trial. However, um, if you don't have any of those conditions, anything that's impacting the vision beyond the keratoconus or the corneal ectasia, you will be a candidate in the trial regardless of your age as long as you're over the age of 18. As far as side effects from the lenses, there are no side effects from these lenses However, in some individuals, if the lens is rotated off axis, it may end up inducing more aberrations and blurring the vision for some individuals. However, that is highly unlikely. Thank you. Now, for the clinical trial, how would a patient enroll? Got it. What would so, be that process? Yes. So what you would do is you would book an appointment with the clinic to have an initial evaluation. Once you have your initial evaluation here, we will decide whether or not you would be a candidate for the clinical trial, at which time you'll be, you'll be offered to participate in it. Once you uh, have been offered to participate in it, you'll be given all the clinical trial instructions about what's involved and the informed consent will need to be signed. If you decide to sign it at that point, we'll go ahead and start the fitting process, at which point we'll go ahead and start placing some lenses on the eye and trying to find a baseline lens as to what may work for you. At that point, we'll go ahead and order a contact lens 
that's customized to your shape of the eye and this will be our standard lens to start with. We'll continue to have various different visits until we get to a finalized fit of the lens that gives you good comfort and good vision with the standard lens. Once we have that lens final, we'll go ahead and take the higher order aberration measurements over the top of the lens and order that lens then we'll have you come in and we'll have you put on both the standard lens and then the higher order aberration correcting lens and take more measurements over the top after that you'll go home with the higher order aberration correcting lens and we'll see you back for follow-ups two weeks after and then six weeks after that to see how your visual acuity is over that time. We have seen that some individuals do improve in their visual acuity um, after they get the lens over a period of a few weeks as they start to adapt to the new vision. Thank you, Dr. Gellies. Now, if I'm not an initial evaluation if I'm currently a patient I see you um, mm -hmm. I could have seen you as as recently as last week is it mm -hmm. advantageous like can I can I just call the office and have you look at my chart to see if you think that these might work for me or would a whole appointment be necessary so generally if I had seen you within the last month certainly we could take a look and see if you may be a candidate for this however if it's outside of that we generally will need you to come back in for the evaluation. All right, thank you. Okay, that looks like that is all that we have right now. Um, if any questions did not get answered or if anybody thinks of any other questions, please email info at vision-institute.com and we'd be happy to get right back to you. Uh, thank you, everybody, for attending our meeting, and we look forward to seeing you in the future for future meetings. Have a great evening. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.